Zanes. Good evening. Ah, oh, yes, people are awake, ready to go. It was that extra hour of sleep, wasn't it? Helped everyone out. Uh, the last week or so, uh, maybe week and a half, um, I've been obsessively trawling Facebook Marketplace, uh, trying to find a bargain, a particular bargain uh, at the moment. Uh, I've got a bit hyped up, inspired. Anyone who knows me knows I kind of hyper-focus on things sometimes, and especially if it's an excuse to buy a toy or spend some money. Uh, I've been really excited for the last week and a bit about the idea of buying a camera to use to film some stuff uh, here at church. And uh, again, for those of you who are around bit and know how things work, you'd know that our budget is as close to zero as possible uh, and the camera we want is as expensive as possible and we're just seeing where we can kind of bring those two things together, right? Um, and the answer is normally a Facebook Marketplace, right? And so I've been on there and doing the good old kind of 25 kilometer kind of search radius, I'll push it out to 38 k's because I really want to get something that I can uh, go and pick up and get that once in a lifetime deal. And so I'm searching for the sort of camera that we want to get. Um, and there's one that's kind of B-grade, it would almost be okay, it sits around the $1,000 mark and it'd be all right. Or there's the one that I really want to get, but all the ones I can find are like $1,700, $1,800, which again, when my budget so far that I've managed to accrue is nothing, um, there's a big difference, $1,700 is a long way. And then I find it. Then I find uh, the camera that I want, the Sony a7 III, for $900 in Sydney. That's the one that's meant to be $1,700, $1,800, and I found it for $900. Sure, it doesn't have a lens, but that's okay. That's just a couple of hundred bucks, and I get so excited. So I messaged this person, is it available? Yes, it's available. That's going to get snapped up soon. I need to get it, right? I need to get on this. So I send him a message, what's the pickup location, right? It's just, you know when it just shows Sydney City? And it's like, unless that person lives on the Harbour Bridge, they've just put a very generic postcode in, where are they really? And they send me back the address, and it's a home address in Dubbo. Right. Right. It is a lot of hundreds of dollars. <laughs> but I also start wondering. Alarms kind of start going off at that point, right? Ooh, really, really cheap. Not ridiculously cheap, but almost kind of just too good to be true. Set as a location in Sydney so that all of us Sydney people kind of get invested in it, and then it's actually a regional location and they're fairly quick to come back at me, oh, that's okay, if it's too far, I can post it. They go, oh, well, you're just a bit too quick to offer that. And, and the, the sceptical, cynical mind starts kind of turning over, right? Things don't quite add up. Or maybe, flip it around, maybe things add up a bit too well, right? And, and that's the problem. So I'm sceptical, kind of critical thinking. I don't want to be naive and gullible and get sucked in and scammed, right? But on the other hand, I don't want to miss out on this camera for $900 if it's real. I don't want to miss out on the bargain of the century, miss out on something wonderful, because I was too sceptical to believe. You can ask me after church what ended up happening with that camera. But we find ourselves tonight reading the story of Thomas and finding Thomas in actually a, a similar situation, right? that Thomas has heard something that just seems too good to be true, that seems absurd, and his friends are all hyped about it, but really, really, could it be true? And as we look at his story, we get to wrestle, just like he did, with this question, is it, is it okay to doubt Jesus? Like, do we have to be naive to be a Christian? Does God only want gullible people in heaven? Is it okay to want evidence to know that what we believe is logical to be a critical thinking, intelligent person? Can, can we bring our brains to the table when it comes to faith, or do we have to check them at the door? We're going to be exploring that tonight as we look at the story of the man who's become known as Doubting Thomas. And as we do that, I hope that for each of us tonight, we find out not only that maybe it is okay to have some of our doubts, but to hear Jesus' answers to Thomas and move from our doubts to confidence in Him. But to do that, let's have a look at the story. I'm going to catch you up just on the 
kind of where we're sitting in our story so you know what's going on with Thomas. Um, just like we are currently sitting a week after Easter on Sunday, a bunch of believers in a room together, Thomas finds himself a week after Easter on a Sunday evening sitting in a room with a bunch of believers, right? So uh, in that sense, that's really easy to grab hold of in our minds. He's doing stuff like us. Um, but if we were to rewind back a week on Easter Sunday, in the morning, Jesus has appeared to Mary Magdalene, and she's run off and she's told a bunch of people. Then Jesus has turned up, and you heard this read out by Ames, Jesus has turned up and He's spoken to 10 out of the 12. The two who are missing are Thomas, off doing the shopping, or whatever Thomas happens to be doing, and of course Judas, who uh, isn't there with them anymore. Jesus appears to them, and by the time Thomas gets back from whatever He's been doing, Jesus is no longer there, but a crazy story is going around. Those disciples say to Thomas, Jesus is back from the dead. And what's Thomas's response? What does Thomas say? Thomas says, unless I see the nail marks in his hands, put my finger where the nails were, put my hand into his side, that's where the spear went when Jesus was being crucified, I will not believe it. This is where he gets that nickname I mentioned, Doubting Thomas, right? He had a nickname, it's the one that's actually in the Bible, Didymus, which means the twin, represent any other twins out there? I don't know, a couple, a couple of other twins here. His nickname was the twin, but we've kind of replaced it for the last few thousand years with Doubting Thomas because he hears Jesus is back from the dead and doesn't believe. Now, I think it's worth pausing just to be a little bit more fair to poor Doubting Thomas. Um, all of the other disciples, one week earlier, haven't seen Jesus back from the dead, Mary sees Jesus, comes running in, says Jesus is back from the dead, and what do they all do? They stay hiding in a locked room, not believing, until Jesus turns up and shows them the holes in His hands and in His side, and then they believe and are filled with joy. So really, Thomas here just does what everyone else did, he's just a week later and he's on his own, and so we've given him a really bad rap, right? He's famous for doubting, but he's going to be the one who cops it, from Jesus and from history. And the question then for us there is, does that mean it's not okay to doubt? Does that mean it's, it's not okay for those of us who are Christians or wondering about God to have our doubts? What's the lesson we're going to take from Thomas? Well, the first thing that maybe is really helpful as you wonder about your doubts is to realize that Thomas doesn't really just doubt, right? Like, the disciples don't all kind of run up to Thomas when he arrives back and say, Thomas, Thomas, Jesus has come back from the dead. And Thomas goes, doubt it. Right? It's not the text that we have, is it? It's more than that. He doesn't just say like, oh, I'm not, I'm not really convinced yet. What does he say? If you've got your Bibles there, let's look at exactly what he said. Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, put my fingers where the nails were, put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. He doesn't just doubt, he refuses to believe. In fact, if we were looking at kind of in the original Greek that John wrote it, what he said is, I will not, not believe. Right? Two different words for not. They put double negative there for emphasis, right? So some of your translations might say, he said, I will never believe. Right? He emphasizes, I will not believe. We don't do the double negative because then all the youth group kids would be like, oh, but Josh, doesn't it actually say, I will not not believe, and that actually means that he will believe, right? So when we translate it, we don't put that. There were some youth group kids already smirking before I even said that. That's why the NIV chose to just put the word not there. But Thomas like slams his fist down, I will not. He refuses to believe. So he doesn't just doubt, he full on refuses to believe. But even still, does that mean that Jesus is about to get angry at someone just because they don't believe? They're not gullible enough. They're not naive enough to just take an absurd claim without even thinking about it. I think it's easy for us to see Thomas's story and think that, to assume we're not allowed to disbelieve, right? But let's have a think about Thomas's last three years leading up to this moment. Some of you will know them better. Some of you, let me tell you what Thomas's last three years have been like. About three years before this, he started following a man named Jesus. And him and a couple of other guys who were following Jesus, they went to a wedding together. And at the wedding, they ran out of wine. And so Jesus made a thousand bottles of wine out of water and shared it around so that there was enough to drink and it was the best wine they'd ever drunk. 
There was another time where Thomas and a bunch of his mates were going across the lake, they'd left Jesus behind, so we just walked across the lake. Thomas was there, he saw that happen. There was a time Thomas was there with Jesus and there were 5,000 people, some of you youth guys heard about this on Friday night, there were 5,000 people and what was it like, a handful of loaves and a couple of fish. And Thomas saw Jesus break those apart and feed 5,000 people and Thomas walked around with a basket collecting up the leftovers. He, he, He felt the weight in that basket of what used to just be a couple of loaves and a couple of fish and he was there. When the man born blind had his sight restored, Thomas was there. Imagine Thomas there with the other disciples when Jesus turns up at Lazarus's tomb. Lazarus by this point has been dead for four days and everyone's like, that's going to stink, don't roll the stone away. But they roll the stone away and Jesus stands there at an open grave and says, Lazarus, come out. And can you imagine the expectant hush like the awkward moment, and Thomas is there, peering into the dark of that tomb, seeing the first glimpse of movement, as Lazarus, a dead man, walks out of the tomb. Thomas has been there with Jesus for the last three years, and he's heard Jesus saying, I'm going to be arrested, I'm going to be killed, and I'm going to come back from the dead. And now, he has the unanimous eyewitness testimony of 10 of his closest, most trusted friends in the world, all telling him exactly what Jesus said was going to happen has happened. The guy who raised other people from the dead, he's back from the dead. And even with that, he refuses to believe. He says, I will not, not believe. Even with all of that. See, this is more than doubting, isn't it? If you're wondering, oh, I don't want to be like Thomas, I don't want to accidentally doubt like he does, Thomas doesn't just doubt. He doesn't say to them, oh, well, let's go and find Jesus. If he's back from the dead, can you take me to him and show me? He doesn't try and start investigating. He doesn't start wrestling with it. He doesn't start with a bunch of follow-up questions, trying to figure out if it's true or not. He just says, I will not believe unless Jesus turns up here in front of me and shows me. Perhaps not doubting Thomas, We need something stronger. Maybe a a slightly better version in English would be to to call him like disbelieving Thomas, but even still, it's almost like anti-believing Thomas, like with everything that was in front of him and all of his experiences of Jesus, he still says, I will not believe this one unproven thing despite countless proven things. What he, what he essentially says is, my experience, my own personal experience of Jesus and life and my own knowledge and understanding takes me this far and I will not go one millimetre past that out of faith. I will not believe anything beyond what my personal experience can verify, no matter what Jesus has done, no matter what evidence is on the table. I will not go past what I can see and touch more than doubt. But I do wonder whether some of us, all of us, I said in myself, have times where we're not just like doubting Thomas, maybe we're like disbelieving Thomas. Do we, do we have a little bit of that in our hearts as well? That is, we know who Jesus is, like we know the things that He said, we've heard the things that He did, And yet, when we hit something that we can't understand, when we hit something that's hard to believe, despite all those things we know, we fall back into unbelief. We fall back into not trusting. I know too many people who've had God answer prayer after prayer after prayer after prayer in their life, year after year, of God listening to their prayers and answering. But then there's this one prayer that they really want him to answer in a particular way and he doesn't. And so they don't believe in him anymore. I know people who've lived obediently following Jesus, obeyed him a hundred times and every time gone, I don't regret that. He is wise, he is good. The way he says to live is good for me and is good for others. I trust him, I believe in him. And then they hit that one that doesn't make sense. That one that they can't understand. The one that doesn't seem good to them. And suddenly that belief is replaced with not trusting Him, not following Him anymore. 
Is it that you've had a hundred tricky questions answered? You've gone to Scripture and you've tried to find different contradictions, different loopholes, different things uh, that the archaeological record, come next Monday night, um, wouldn't match. And you've come with your hard questions and time after time the Bible has stood up to them. It's been answered. God's Word has proven trustworthy and faithful, but then you see a TikTok or a reel that bags it out in a different way and straight away, aha, I got you this time. Right, fall straight back into not trusting God's Word. Do we have it a little bit in our heart as well? Where is the limit for you? The limit of your own personal experience? The things which you have seen and do have proof of? And anything beyond that? Anything that would require faith to accept, because you can't wrap your head around it or you can't find enough evidence, you find it really hard to say, I'm going to let go and I'm going to trust God, even though I don't have that, even though I don't understand that, even though I haven't seen that. Perhaps you don't even follow Jesus yet, and, and for you, that question of unbelief is very much like Thomas's. You say, I, I just need more evidence, and then I would believe in God. I, it, it breaks my heart to remember the hundreds of Scripture students who I've taught over the years, who have said things like, I'd believe in God if there was proof. And so we spend one lesson, two lessons, five lessons, ten lessons, walking them through all different kinds of proof, from scientific proof and philosophical proof and historical proof and testimonial proof and all these different things. And then at the end, they're still going, oh, like, if there's any proof, I'd believe it. Saying, if only there was more proof, I would believe. When in reality, hello, when in reality, there's already more than enough evidence to believe. We already have enough to justify putting our faith in Jesus. And maybe the reason that we don't believe is more to do with our heart than our head. There's something else that we love. There's something else that we don't want to give up. There's some other reason. But we sidestep it by saying, oh, unless. We're surrounded by so much evidence, aren't we? of Jesus' existence, for a start, that there is a God, like the, the universe that we are in cries out that there is a Creator, right? Everything around us shows us that there's a Creator. Throughout history, we see the impact of this real man, Jesus of Nazareth, His life, His teaching, His death, His resurrection, indisputable despite thousands of years of people coming up with different theories, maybe they stole the body, maybe He had a twin, all that no other theory to explain it except His resurrection, we then see the way His power has been outworked across the planet for thousands of years with billions of people testifying to the fact that Jesus has worked in His life. We've had all of that and then we find this little thing and we point to it and we say, oh, but unless this bit makes sense to me, I don't want to believe. Unless someone can explain this, unless this happens, Friends, there are times when we will not have the exact knowledge, the exact wisdom, the exact evidence or proof that we need, that we want. And in those times, based on everything we know of Jesus, we need to let go and believe. Like I've got mine where I run into walls, I've got theological ones that I run into as soon as we start talking things like Trinity and predestination, shout out Wednesday afternoon crew that we're starting to get into that one and I start hitting points where I go, I can't get my head fully around this, my only option from here is to trust, trust that God's got this even if my brain can't get this. I, I got moral ones like there's things where Jesus has said to live in a particular way and I've seen lots of ways where that works, and so I start to be like, oh yeah, I can see, Jesus is wise, that's good, and I start to want to obey Him because it makes sense to me. And then I find myself like maybe counselling someone or, or having a friend, and, and I'm trying to talk through some of Jesus' kind of guidance and wisdom and rules, um, and suddenly I can't make sense of it in my own head, and my only option there 
is to say, you know what, I don't know why he says that, but he does. And from what I know of him, I trust him, I believe. I've got my own experiences and people came up to me this morning to talk about this one. I hit a wall here when it comes to tragedy. And we could describe a thousand tragedies, couldn't we? Where I hit a wall and in my head I just cannot really make sense of if God is good and if God is loving, why did that happen? But I know what I know about Jesus. And from what I know, I can say, look, I don't understand that but I'm going to let go and trust. I hit a point where my own sense, my own experience aren't going to be enough to convince me. And I just need to let go and believe. And I think there'd be a, a hundred different ways that that would be true for each of us here tonight. Well, how does Jesus respond to Thomas in this situation? I mentioned before, Jesus gets angry at him and Thomas is the one who cops it. But how much attention were you paying when, when Ains read it? Does, does Jesus get angry? Does Thomas really cop it? Um, open it up if you've still got it there. Let's, let's see what, what actually happens. Thomas says, I will not, not believe. A week later, the disciples were in the house again. Thomas was with them. The, the doors were locked. Jesus came and stood among them, said, peace be with you. Doesn't sound super angry at the moment, does he? They said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand, put it in my side, stop doubting and believe. What an aggressive shout down. Right? He didn't. Thomas doesn't get rebuked here and he didn't just doubt, he full on disbelieved Jesus in the face of all of that evidence. And even still, Jesus doesn't rip him apart. What does Jesus do? He comes to him. He shows him his scars, those scars that were for Thomas. He shows him those and says, stop doubting, believe. Is Jesus angry with you if you doubt him? Is Jesus disappointed in your disbelief? He wants to come in and chastise you. He's patient but he wants to call you to stop doubting and believe. It's worth noting that I don't think it's fair for us to expect him to turn up in the same way that he turns up to Thomas. At this point, Jesus hadn't gone back into heaven. He was still on earth, and so it made sense that he would turn up and talk to Thomas, but uh, just a couple of weeks after this, about a month after this, Jesus returns to heaven. And he had a special purpose in visiting Thomas because Thomas is going to be an apostle. An apostle is someone who's seen Jesus after he came back from the dead. That's one of their criteria. So, so Jesus turns up to Thomas for a very specific reason. And I, I don't think it's right for us to expect him to do that in our passenger seat on the way home when we're saying, well, uh, I'm not going to believe either. Right? You turned up for Thomas, my turn. Right? We don't have that promise that he will turn up in the same way because he's in heaven now. But he has other ways of showing up. As we gather together as His body, He shows up. As the Holy Spirit works in our heart, He shows up. As wise friends, counsellors, as events around us take place, Jesus shows up. And when Jesus shows up, what does Thomas do? What's His response? He stands before Him and says, My Lord and my God. He recognises Him, He stops doubting and believes that Jesus is God, and not just God of the whole universe and therefore in control of everything, but Lord, the one who I'm going to follow, the one who I'm going to dedicate my life to, the one who will rule over my life, my Lord and my God. Again, Jesus doesn't sink the boot in, tell Thomas off, chastise him, but he does have something pretty special to say to us. Here's verse 29. Thomas has said, my Lord and my God. Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Right? Still, still no anger, right? He's still not giving him a backhand. Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus says there's actually something special about those who will not get their doubts and their disbeliefs 
answered in such a concrete way like Thomas did. That there are those who will not see the resurrected Jesus in this life and still believe. That that opportunity to take a step in faith and say, okay, my brain got me to hear and based on that, I'm going to trust. Right? That there's something special, there's something profound about doing that. The Thomas never got a chance because Jesus just turned up and said, Thomas, your brain, your senses can take you the whole way. He never got to take that step of trust, that step of faith. Jesus said there is a blessing for those who haven't seen the risen Jesus and yet believe. Friends, that's us, isn't it? That's the opportunity we have. We, we, we haven't seen the risen Jesus and we won't yet. We will one day, but not yet. Jesus said it is a blessing to us to take what we know of Jesus, to look at the world around us, and from that to say, you know what, even though it's not, he hasn't appeared right here, I'm going to put my faith in him. I'm going to trust him. The whole point of this book of John, Friday nights for youth, here for four years on Sundays uh, for the rest of us, the whole point of the book of John is that we might all be able to do the same as what Thomas ended up doing. To look at Jesus and stop doubting, stop disbelieving and believe. Because what was it that Thomas had that most of us don't have? He knew all of that stuff about Jesus. He knew who Jesus was and what he'd done. And so as he was getting old, John, Jesus' best friend, sits down and he, he writes those things. We read in verse 30 and 31. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples that aren't recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you might have life in his name. So that's why John told us about Jesus turning water into wine. That's why John told us about Jesus walking on water and feeding the 5,000 and raising Lazarus from the dead. So that we would know those things about Jesus. But not just know the power that he had, also know the sort of person that he is, right? That uh, he would go out of his way to sit with that Samaritan woman who was an outcast from society, who no one would spend time with because her relationships had been a mess and she was broken and scarred and yet Jesus wanted to be with her. We know what he's done. We know who he is. Can I suggest that if you're not sure about Jesus... It's fine to keep looking into evidence, but don't keep following that cycle of every time you find a bit of evidence, you just think of another bit that you lack and another bit and that keeps being an excuse not to believe. Get to know Jesus. Go back to the start of John and read his story. See whether this Jesus is someone you can trust. As with all the evidence that we have around us, from the world that we're in to the things that we know about Jesus... I want you to reflect, what is it for you that you think Jesus would say to you, stop doubting and believe? What is it that you need to believe tonight? How is it in your life that you have an opportunity to come before Jesus and say, my Lord and my God? Maybe for the first time, maybe for the thousandth time. Maybe, maybe it is for you to s- stop doubting based on one little bit of evidence that's not there and believe that Jesus is real. <laughs> that God is real, that Jesus is Him. That He died for your sins, that He was raised to life. Perhaps it's that you need to stop doubting and believe that God is truly good and He loves you. Even though that's hard to make sense of with the things that are going on at the moment. Maybe the thing that you find it hard not to doubt is that he's actually listening when you pray. But from what we know of Jesus, you need to stop doubting and believe that when you pray, God hears you as a loving Heavenly Father. Is it that you need to stop disbelieving and believe that when he said he's coming back again, he will? And He will completely change this world to wipe away all sin and suffering and death and anyone who is with Him will have eternity in paradise with Him with all suffering gone and every tear wiped away. 
Is it that you struggle to really believe that he has forgiven you? He's not holding anything against you. There's no reason to be ashamed anymore. He's washed you clean. You find it hard to believe that. You deep down doubt that. Get to know Jesus and believe it. Is it that you struggle to believe that whatever you give up for him and for the sake of the gospel, that it will be worth it a hundred times over? Because we know who he is. We know his story. If you, if you don't, get on it. We know what he did. When we look around us, you know enough. Stop doubting him and believe. I'm going to pray that we all might do that. Jesus, thank you that you dealt so patiently with Thomas when he not just doubted but rejected belief in you. Jesus, thank you that you're patient with us. I, I ask for all of us here tonight that just like you showed up for Thomas, that you'll show up for us in different ways, that you'll reveal yourself to us. Jesus, help us not to doubt, not to disbelieve but with everything that you've shown us and everything that you've done for us. Jesus, help us to trust you. Help us to believe. We ask that in your name. Amen.